Good morning. Welcome to the Pittsburgh Conference and the Pittsburgh Analytical Chemistry Award Symposium. This is a special award that is established in recognition of an individual's significant contributions to the field of analytical chemistry. Um, some of these contributions include introduction of a significant technique, theory, or instrument, and providing exceptional training or a fertile environment for progress in analytical chemistry. Each award winner was carefully picked by the Society for Analytical Chemists of Pittsburgh committee members who are qualified by education or occupation to further the purposes of our society in Pittsburgh and the Pittsburgh Conference. I am pleased to announce that our 2014 awardee is Richard M. Crooks. Professor Crooks received his BS and doctoral degrees in chemistry from the University of Illinois and the University of Texas at Austin. His independent career has been split between Texas A&M University and the University of Texas Austin, where he presently holds the Welsh Chair in Materials Chemistry. His research program focuses on biosensing and electrocatalysis. Professor Crooks has been a strong leader in exploring how nanostructures, particularly spontaneously developed nanostructures, can participate in and benefit electrochemical processes. Now published in more than 200 papers, his work has explored uses of dendromers, metallic clusters, and microelectronic structures. It has had important bearing on novel sensors. His laboratory demonstrated transport and detection of single molecules and particles through individual carbon nanotubes. This technology offers great potential in quantifying the kinetics of pore entry, pore molecular size ratio, quantifying quantify use bulk membranes. It is also a technological importance as commercial particle counters are limited to counting particles of size greater than 300 nanometers. The original Crookes publications were the first that demonstrated stochastic transport through individual synthetic pores of nanometer dimensions, an experiment that exploded into an entire field of research. More recently, Professor Crookes has pioneered the use of bipolar electrodes. In this work, he uses established electrochemiluminescent reactions to enable visualization of electron transfer reactions at the electrodes. He has explored the properties of these electrodes in analytical chemistry applications as well as fundamental chemical characterization. In addition to these scientific contributions, Dr. Crooks has been very active at the national level in promoting the field of analytical chemistry. He is a co-founder with Antonio Rico of the Gordon Conference on Chemical Sensors and Interfacial Design and has chaired numerous conferences and symposia. He is a senior editor with Langmuir and has organized guest edited special issues of the Journal of Physical Chemistry and accounts of chemical research that were devoted to chemical sensor research. And now I would like to have Heather Joswa, Chairman of the Society of Analytical Chemists of Pittsburgh, present the award, which is a scroll, and a check to Professor Crooks. Thank you, Annette. He is internationally regarded for his impact in the field of chemical sensors. His work with surface acoustic wave-based sensors and novel coatings has led to the development of array-based gas sensors. He made the first measurements of transport through single carbon nanotubes. He is among the most cited analytical chemists in the world in the field of molecular self-assembly and for self-assembly on surfaces. He is a renowned and dedicated educator. In view of his distinguished contributions to analytical chemistry, the Society for Analytical Chemists of Pittsburgh is proud to confer this award to Dr. Richard M. Crooks. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, everyone for getting up really early for this. I appreciate it. Uh, 
You know, I've never read prepared comments before, but I'm going to do it <laughs> because I'm really nervous. <laughs> so bear with me. It won't take too long, but there are a bunch of people I want to thank. So first of all, I want to thank I want to thank the people who chose me for the award, uh, obviously, and uh, the Society for Analytical Chemists of Pittsburgh, um, especially for making the award possible. And uh, I, I also want to say that um, the SACP actually gave me my very first research grant ever. I was a, it was a Pittsburgh Starter a Grant Award, and so. Um, you know, I feel very good about, I felt very good about getting that award and now all these years later from the same society to receive this award is a, a real affirmation for me of um, what I've been doing for the past 25 years. Um, I want to thank a few people. One, one person I want to thank is Ken Jensen who is an um, analytical chemist at Argonne National Lab and um, at a time when I really didn't feel like returning to the University of Illinois to finish my bachelor's degree, he urged me to do that. And uh, when I was there, I ran into Larry Faulkner, and Larry, uh, I worked in his lab as an undergraduate, and, and Larry really got me motivated to be an analytical chemist. And, and he sent me down to work with Professor Bard at the University of Texas, where I learned to do analytical chemistry, and then uh, from there, I went to uh, MIT and worked with Mark Wrighton, who toughened me up a bit. And I, if you know Mark, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I want to thank the other four speakers in this symposium, um, some of whom are uh, former uh, awardees for this particular award, Al Bard, Chad Merkin, Tony Rico, uh, and George Whitesides. Um, I asked these people to present in this symposium because uh, their influence on me, on my, uh, the science that I've done over the years, has been the most significant of, uh, of anyone. And I'm grateful to them for not just being here, but also for, uh, for influencing um, the things that I've done. And I need to thank the people from my research group who are here. Uh, actually, they all got together on uh, Sunday night and former group members uh, to have a dinner for me and I was stuck in the Dallas airport uh, by an ice storm and missed that but I, um, I there were many pictures coming in well after 2 a.m. so I know I know everyone had fun um, you know one thing that really amazes you about students is you know you walk around campus and they're um, you know, glued to their Twitter feed, and, and then just a year or two later, they get into your research group, and they're having great ideas and working really hard and publishing wonderful research papers, and it's just incredible how quickly that happens. So, and that, that certainly happened with many of the people in my group, and I'm extremely grateful to them for not just working hard, but ha for having many of the ideas that have um, gotten me up here today. So thank you to all my former group members. And then I need to thank one more person. Uh, I need to thank my wife, Julianne. Um, Julianne, uh, you know, anybody who's in this job knows that there's a lot of ups and downs and a lot of moving around from city to city and university to university. And, uh, and she's put up with all of that with me and more. And uh, so I'm really grateful to her as well. Okay, so um, having said all that, let me, uh, let me talk about some science here. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about uh, a project involving um, seawater desalination. There we go. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about a project involving seawater desalination and bring you through about 10 years worth of work that um, that started out as real analytical chemistry. And, uh, and ended up with seawater desalination. So let me um, first thank the people who have been involved. Um, Kyle Knist is a graduate student in my group. Uh, Robin Annan is here, actually. She was a graduate student in my group and is postdocing with Dan Chu at the University of Washington now. Karen Skyda is a graduate student in my group. And then 
our two collaborators um, in Germany who uh, help us with simulations on this project, uh, Dima and, uh, and Ulrich Talarek. I'm grateful to them as well and funding sources. Okay, so let me talk about desalination a little bit first. This has um, been in the news quite a bit lately as, you know, water starts running out. Um, so two-thirds of the world's population will be living in water-stressed regions of the world by 2025. And uh, only a, a half a percent of the Earth's um, water is accessible fresh water, and, and the rest is seawater, an, inf you know, an infinite supply of seawater. And so uh, one potential and reliable solution um, to you know, the world's water needs is desalination, because it doesn't require snowfall in the Sierra or you know, rainfall. It's very reliable. So let me remind you what osmosis is because reverse osmosis is the, the most popular form of desalination. So if I start out with two equal volumes of liquid in a tube separated by a semi-permeable membrane, and one side has a concentrated salt solution on it, and the other side just has water, if I wait a while, um, water molecules, uh, not ions, but just water molecules, will penetrate through the membrane and uh, to equalize the concentrations on the two sides and the uh, the, the solution volume on the right side, the salty side, will increase. Now, this height can be converted into a pressure, and that's called the osmotic pressure. And then when one does uh, reverse osmosis, one applies at least an equal and opposite pressure, and that's shown on the right here, and that pushes water molecules back through the semi-permeable membrane, creating pure water on the left and uh, a saltier solution on the right. So this has been upscaled pretty dramatically. This is a desalination plant in um, Saudi Arabia. And each one of these um, cylinders here contains uh, a membrane, a very thin membrane, about 300 nanometers thick, that's used um, for desalination. And these membranes are, are rolled up, put in these canisters, and they put out an enormous amount of fresh water every day. So here's a picture of how this works. There's feed water coming in from usually the sea and a, a pump. This is the problem, is that the pump requires a lot of energy. And, uh, and that's pushed in. Here's that filter. It's a polyimid filter usually, and as I said, just a few hundred nanometers thick. And the usual thing is 50% of the water goes up a brine stream, and 50% of the water comes out desalted. So you would say in this case that there's 50 percent recovery of the water and this brine stream is then um, redirected back into the ocean or wherever it came from. So um, desalination by reverse osmosis has uh, gotten much more efficient over the years and if you look at this plot starting in the 1970s the, uh, the energy efficiency was around 15 uh, watt hours per liter of water, of uh, desalted water. And, uh, and it's steadily come down, and the latest data I could find is 2008. Now, this dashed line here is the theoretical thermodynamic minimum for removing salt from water. So just to take a sodium ion out of water and put it somewhere else costs about uh, one watt hour per liter. So reverse osmosis has become quite efficient. It's about twice, um, it costs about twice as much energy as the theoretical minimum. Um, to make uh, water by this approach, and it's uh, very effective in terms of desalination, 99% um, salt rejection, which is what's required for drinking water. Now, there are some problems, of course, and here are the two main ones, membrane fouling and pretreatment of water. Those are, of course, coupled. So this feed water coming in from the sea contains uh, microbes and, and other um, pr uh, things that cause problems for the filter, and so typically uh, the feed stream is chlorinated to kill the microbes so that they don't grow on the filters. The problem is that the filter itself is um, not resistant to chlorine, and so after killing the microbes, the water has to be then dechlorinated. Those costs are not included in the energy efficiency. The energy efficiency is calculated just based on the energy of the pump required to push through the filter. And then, uh, and then the water goes through the filter, and then it's lightly chlorinated again for municipal drinking water. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about electrochemistry now for a minute. There are a couple of existing electrochemical methods 
for, uh, for, de for doing desalination. One is called electrodialysis, and this is, this is pretty simple. There's an electrode, a top electrode, and a bottom electrode, and a power supply. Um, salt water comes in the center, and it's separated from a brine stream, from two brine streams, by uh, an anion selective membrane and a cation selective membrane. So here come the ions down the channel. Um, this negative potential or negative voltage at the top, at the top electrode by electrophoresis um, brings ions up into the brine channel through the selective membrane, and then the same thing happens um, at the positive electrode with negative ions down here, and desalted water comes out the center of the channel. About 4% of desalinated water is made this way. The rest is, uh, almost all the rest is by reverse osmosis. A little bit, um, there's a little bit of, um, of desalination done by capacitive deionization, and, th and this is a little bit like a supercapacitor. Uh, there's a porous electrode top and bottom, and then through this central channel comes ions, and positive and negative ions are attracted into these porous electrodes and just held there capacitively. And um, the problem with this approach, and the reason this hasn't caught on, is because it's a bat really a batch technique. Once the porous electrodes become saturated with ions, then you've got to, you know, reverse the voltage, remove the ions, and then start the process again. Okay? So when we, start, when we started getting involved in desalination, this was the, the state of the art. Okay, now I need to talk about one more thing, and that's um, bipolar electrodes. I'm, I think everyone in here understands, um, you know, basic electrochemistry. This is a, a three-electrode cell, and um, the, the way this works, uh, you know, normal electrochemistry is here's an electrode, a side view of an electrode, there are electrons at a particular energy in the electrode, and then there's a, an available redox state out in solution. And if I move the potential of the electrode sufficiently high, then electrons will transfer across the interface. This is what we call Faradaic electrochemistry. And, uh, and if the potential of the electrode is below uh, the redox state available in solution, there's no electron transfer. Okay, So this is the normal, normal way of doing electrochemistry. Bipolar electrochemistry is a little bit different. Um, it, the way that we carry this out is in a microchannel. So most of what I'll be talking about today is in a, a PDMS um, uh, microchannel, about 20 microns high, maybe um, you know 100 or a few hundred microns wide. And microfabricated in that channel is a wire. And um, in some cases, this is gold for us. In other cases, it's pyrolyzed photoresist. And this is a power supply. And at either end of this microchannel, there are um, electrodes immersed in wells. And when I apply a potential to both sides of the, uh, both ends of the channel and start turning up the voltage, what I observe, uh, what I would observe is bubbles coming off the two ends of this electrode. And uh, I actually um, first, you know, saw this when I was on sabbatical uh, with Tony Rico out in uh, the Bay Area back in uh, 2000 or something like that. And uh, it was really fascinating to me. I mean, it turned out that this was known already. But it, um, it was fascinating that you could do electrochemistry at this surface, even though it's not in direct electrical contact with the power supply. And, uh, and, and that the electrode itself, even though it's doing both an oxidation and reduction, is an equipotential surface. OK? So the anode induces a cathode on the bipolar electrode, and the uh, anode induces uh, a uh, the anode induces uh, a, the cathode induces an anode at the bipolar electrode. Okay, and the way you understand this is shown um, down here. here um, this is um, with reference to this upper drawing. You can see here's the bipolar electrode, and uh, there's a cathodic pole, cathodic pole, and an anodic pole. And when this voltage is applied across the channel, there's a resistive drop in solution. You remember the, the solution in that channel is, um, you know, in a, uh, uh, it's a real small channel. So there's a potential drop in the channel. And it's this potential difference between the electrode and the solution and the electrode and the solution that drives the electron transfer processes. So over here, um, you can think of this as controlling the uh, energy of the electrons in the electrode relative to the solution. And in bipolar electrochemistry, we control the potential of the solution relative to the electrode. 
Well, that's fine because it doesn't really matter which way you do it. The only important thing is that the potential difference between the electrode and the solution be sufficient to drive Faradayic electrochemistry. All right, everybody okay with that? Okay. Okay, so here's an experiment, um, you know, that, that we did, that actually Robin and my group did, who's here today. And um, it's the, this is the setup, as I just described. This is the bipolar electrode. Uh, this is the microchannel. And the electrode um, spans, you know, outside the channel here, but that's just, you know, when you put the channel on the electrode, it just makes it easier to hit the electrode. You don't need to worry about any of this or any of this. This is the bipolar electrode, just the part in the channel here. So the channel in this case was filled with one millimolar tris uh, buffer, and so very dilute concentration of tris, and then um, a marker, uh, bodipi, just um, so we can, you know, follow what's happening in the channel. So let me just play this little movie. I, I should say it's set up so that electrophoresis will drive um, uh, the marker, bodipi, from left to right, and electroosmosis um, will drive the marker from right to left. Okay. There we go. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> so you can see what's happening. The, um, the edge of this uh, electrode, this edge right here, is right about, right about here. And you see what's happening is the, um, the Bodipi dye is concentrating just to the right of the anode of, or the cathode of the bipolar electrode. And, and this experiment was, I think, I don't know, we'd have to check with Robin, but I think a little bit of an accident. I'm, I'm not sure we were expecting this to happen. But it was really uh, a fascinating result, and we worked with our colleagues in Germany, the simulators, uh, to better understand this. Okay, so here's, here's the picture of the device. And the first question is, what's happening at the anode and the cathode? What, what reactions are occurring? We don't really care about the anode reaction in this case, but this, this is it. But at the cathode, um, you know, water is being reduced to hydroxide, and then what's happening is this hydroxide is then reacting in homogeneous solution with tris H plus to form neutral tris. And, and that's the key reaction, because neutral tris, um, you know, in, in essence, this reaction is knocking charge carriers out of the solution in this region near the electrode, and that increases the resistance of the solution in that localized area. So this is uh, just a cartoon showing that. Here's the bipolar electrode. Here's the black is the hydroxide. It's diffusing out into solution where it encounters tris H plus, and there's this region then um, where tris H plus is uh, uh, deprotonated to form neutral tris. And then this is really the key diagram here. Here's again the bipolar electrode cathode. This, um, this region of high resistance causes uh, a region of, um, of uh, a, lo a local um, electric field gradient near the bipolar electrode cathode. Let's see how that affects, you know, a negative ion like Bodipi. So here comes Bodipi, and it's moving from um, right to left by electroosmosis, by conve convection. And as it enters this local electric field gradient, the electrophoretic component, um, the electromigration component, starts becoming larger. That's the blue vector here as it moves up this gradient. That doesn't affect the electroosmosis. Electroosmosis, because water is a non-compressible fluid, is constant throughout the microchannel. It only cares about the total electric field. But the, um, but the, uh, the, the uh, electrophoretic component uh, depends on the local electric field gradient. Okay, so there'll be a point here on this gradient where electroosmosis and electrophoresis is exactly balanced. These are, this is one of a family of techniques called counterflow methods, and, uh, and the Bodipi then will enrich there. Okay. And um, after we learned that, then another student in the group, Karen Skyda, um, you know, the question was, could we capture these, could we enrich more than one band, and if we could, 
could we capture those two bands, you know, really permanently separate them? And, and Karen Skida in this um, lab on a chip paper showed that that was possible. So um, these, are, these balls represent um, two different compounds that are being separately enriched and separated because the, um, the compounds experience the same electroosmotic flow but different um, electrophoretic velocities. And so they, they um, separate in different locations. And then there were, the, uh, we put bipolar electrode gates in this, where this, um, the channel splits into two, and we could open and close those gates just with a, a simple electrical switch turning on and off the bipolar electrode. So when the gates open, um, both of these charged bands uh, move from right to left, and um, you know, one of the compounds is moved into the top, and then the gate is closed on the right, and then the left gate is opened, and, and the second compound goes to the left. Okay? So the, all of this is done um, with bipolar electrochemistry, and then the question was, you know, we, we thought, we're trying to think what we could do with this, and uh, I can't remember who, but somebody in our group, uh, one of our subgroup meetings suggested maybe we can desalt water this way, and so that's what we moved on to next. Now, the device for doing this is just a little bit more complicated, but um, I, you know, it's not necessary to really understand what's happening here in its entirety. Just to say there are now two microchannels instead of just one, and these microchannels are in electrochemical communication via a bipolar electrode that spans the two channels, although they're not in fluidic contact. All for the purposes of this experiment, the only thing that's really important about this is that um, the, uh, the, this, whatever process is happening at this end of the bipolar electrode is out of the picture. It's not affecting what's happening up in the business end, the, de the desalinating part of the bipolar, of the, uh, of the device. Okay, so what's going to happen up here is this is now going to be the depletion zone where this, you know, high um, local electric field forms, and we'll start with water flowing, not by electroosmosis in this case, but by pressure-driven flow, just with a you know, small um, head of liquid in this well, and um, that liquid will then flow down the channel. This local electric field will prevent charged species from entering it. Charged species will be shunted up the brine stream. Fresh water or anything that's um, uncharged uh, will go down the desalted stream. That's the idea. This is the actual device. Um, it's a little hard to see. You can certainly see the bipolar electrode here. And then you can see this is the lower channel, this is the upper channel that splits into two, and then this is um, uh, just two electrodes for measuring the conductivity of the water in the desalted stream. Okay, so let's talk about seawater now for just a minute. We actually do these experiments in, in real seawater, which requires um, Kyle going down to uh, the Gulf Coast for the weekend to, uh, to collect. And uh, so seawater, of course, mostly water, 3.5% salt, and of that salt, uh, most is chloride. Now, the reason this experiment is going to work, you remember we were generating that um, local electric field earlier in the TRIS buffer by neutralizing TRIS. So if this trick is going to work with seawater, we have to neutralize something, and, and it's just absolutely fortuitous that that something is um, chloride going to chlorine. You know, the, uh, you know, in my career at least, 25 years or however long it's been, almost nothing works well, okay? <laughs> okay. And uh, this is one experiment where two or three things have worked perfectly just by pure chance, okay? And this is one of them. So here, um, chloride is oxidized to chlorine, and, and this is the equivalent of that uh, Tris neutralization reaction. Two charge carriers are being converted into one neutral species, and so at, at the junction of the, um, uh, where the bipolar electrode is, at the junction of that Y channel, that's where the local electric field's gonna be, and it's gonna be caused by, by this reaction. Okay, if that's true, we should be able to measure the local electric field in that region, and this is the experiment Kyle set up to do that. Here's a, a, a little fancier um, fluidic device. The main difference between this one and the previous one I showed you are all these electrodes here, okay? And uh, this was an experiment, actually, again, Robin cooked up, and you, these electrodes, this is a, an exploded view here, these electrodes now are just there to measure the field in the microchannel. 
This is the bipolar electrode here where this reaction will be occurring. And we'll just measure the uh, electric field between pairs of electrodes, the um, potential difference between pairs of electrodes, and we'll just step across all these electrodes that way. And you remember, this is what we're hoping is going to happen. We're going to, you know, we're hoping that, you know, because we're oxidizing chloride to chlorine, that this elevated field will be present in near the electrode surface, and we should be able then to measure this local electric field, and map that out using these, these other electrodes. And this is the result of that experiment. So this is a plot of the electric field as a function of distance. Here's where the bipolar electrode is. You can see it's um, lined up with this upper frame. And you can see, sure enough, there's a, an enhanced electric field just in the vicinity of the bipolar electrode and, and not downstream or upstream of it. So the, it looks like this reaction is occurring and it looks like it's having the desired effect. Okay. So here's what we've got. Let's just look at the anode end of the bipolar electrode. We don't care about the cathode. That's in that other channel. We don't care what's going on down there. So in this case, um, pressure-driven flow is moving from right to left, and, uh, and that'll be opposed by uh, electrophoretic, uh, electrophoretic uh, velocity of ions in the solution. So here's what's happening. Okay, so the orange um, arrows here are the net velocity vectors and the green is convection. So at first, just convection is moving ions from right to left. Now, as these ions start approaching this elevated electric field, they're repelled by the, by the field, and they start moving. Um, the net vector is, is back up away from the electric field, and as they continue, now they continue on their way. They're outside of that you know, local electric field, which is localized right near this electrode. They continue moving and again try to penetrate the electric field and can't, and so are, mo are moved away and eventually um, move up um, into the brine channel. Okay? So you can think of this, I'll show you a better picture of the, what this electric field looks like, a simulation of it uh, in, a, in a minute or two. Okay, so that's what we're hoping happens. These are uh, micrographs, fluorescent micrographs of. of real seawater containing 20 micromolar rubipi, that's a fluorescent tracer, and um, with three volts applied across the microchannel, uh, between the two microchannels, I should say, the top and the bottom microchannel, and zero volts. So if you look at zero volts here, there should be no anode reaction, and the fluorescent dye should be the same um, intensity in both the salted and desalted stream. But now in a three volt uh, potential is applied, you can see there's enhanced fluorescence up the brine stream and decreased fluorescence down the desalted stream. And you can see if you look at line, a fluorescence line scan across these two streams, you can see that that's the case. And we've also, um, that's uh, a fluorescent tracer, we've also um, hooked up a, um, a conductivity meter and that's actually turns out to be not so easy in microfluidic systems, at least it wasn't easy for us. but. Uh, we've been fairly successful in doing that and measure the change in um, the conductivity of the water before and after, and we're rejecting about 25% of the salt. So this is certainly not, you know, there are two big problems with this experiment at the moment, you know, non-scientific problems, technological problems. One is we make about 40 nanoliters of water a day, okay? <laughs> and the other is you can't drink it, okay? <laughs> So, all right, so this is a science experiment. This is not, you know, at this moment going to save the world. Okay, so here's another, this is a control experiment similar to the one I just showed you. Um, it's the setup's the same way, pressure-driven flow from right to left, and uh, in this case, zero volts, in this case, three volts. We run these on battery packs, by the way. It doesn't require a lot of energy, and I'll show you that in just a minute. And in this case, um, in the solution only contains sodium chloride. It's not seawater. And the idea here was to, you know, convince ourselves that it's really the chloride that's controlling the action here. And you can see that's the case. You can see um, less fluorescence in the desalted channel, more fluorescence in the brine channel, and establishment, again, of this local electric field. That's shown in blue here. And it looks just like the seawater um, conductivity shown, or uh, the, the electric field of the uh, seawater uh, shown in red. 
Okay, and then again, um, if you look at the fluorescence line scans across the brine and desalted streams, you can see there's a, an increase in the brine and a decrease in the desalted stream where that fluorescent tracer is. Okay. And then uh, one more control experiment, um, this is sodium sulfate. So, you know, if our hypothesis is correct that chloride's responsible for, uh, for forming this local electric field, um, there should be no effect with sulfate. And you can see that's true. The fluorescence is about the same in both cases, and, uh, and there's no local electric field generated. So we're pretty confident this is chloride that's, that's um, responsible for this. And, and as I said, fortunately, there's a lot of chloride in, uh, in seawater, though I have to say we don't need much. You know, this, um, it's going to turn out that this technique is very energy efficient, and the reason is it's not all the chloride that's being oxidized, it's 0.01% is all that's required to generate the local electric field. Okay, this just compares the, the black is the sodium sulfate, and then the, uh, the blue and the red are the sodium chloride in the seawater. Okay? Okay, these are um, simulations. This is a simulation on the left um, that our collaborator, um, Ulrich Talarek, and, uh, and his postdoc, Dima, carried out. You can see, you know, we're looking down the flow stream here. So here's pressure-driven flow moving seawater down. And this is what the, um, uh, the, the electric field looks like in the vicinity of that bipolar um, anode. And you can see it's blocking transport down the desalt, uh, transport of ions down the desalted stream and shunting them down the brine stream here. Okay. So we've done an energy calculation um, and compared this to the theoretical minimum I showed you at the beginning of the talk. And um, so if we take the, this is um, just um, you know, a plot of current as a function of time. And so we know how much current is flowing. That's how we know the, the amount of chloride that's being oxidized is just 0.01% of the total in the seawater. So here's the steady state um, current due to the oxidation of chloride. And so we have that number, 20 nanoamps, and multiply it times the applied voltage, which is 3 volts, and calculate a power of uh, 60 nanowatts. And then just divide that by our 40 nanoliters you know, per minute of um, desalinated water to get the, uh, the energy efficiency, and it comes to 25 milliwatt hours per liter. Okay, so remember this is for 25% desalted water at 50% of recovery. So we're, you know, we're throwing away 50% of the water down that brine stream and capturing 50% of the partially desalted water. Uh, if you consider that exact same um, metric, and, and, and look at the theoretical energy efficiency, it's 17.5 milliwatt hours per liter. So, you know, we're, what, 50%, just 50% above uh, the theoretical minimum. And if you do this same calculation for um, uh, uh, reverse osmosis, uh, this number is about, um, this number, 25 that we measure, is actually more like 35. So even at this early stage, granted at a very small scale, and under the same conditions and with the same output of desalted water at the same percentage of desalination, we're about 50% more energy efficient than reverse osmosis. The reason for that is that there's no membrane. This is membraneless desalination. So there's no pump required to push water through a membrane. That's the, the bottom line. Okay, so let me conclude here. So let's see, um, chloride oxidation results in an ion depletion zone. So, you know, we've shown that through both these electric field measurements and careful controls, and also the numerical simulations take into account only the chloride oxidation. And they generate the, uh, the appropriate field that's comparable in magnitude and shape to that that we measure uh, experimentally. So demonstrated membraneless seawater desalination. I showed you conductivity measurements, fluorescence micrographs, and numerical simulations that are all in good accord with each other. And, uh, and we've achieved energy um, efficient desalination. There's no pretreatment here. The only, there's no chlorination and dechlorination. Um, all that's required for pretreatment is to let the sand and, and large particles separate out. And that just takes a, a minute or so. Okay, so let me tell you who did all this. This is Kyle. He did the heavy lifting on this project. Karen uh, Skyda contributed. Um, Karen, uh, uh, Robin, sorry, Robin 
actually started this project uh, before she left to go postdoc. And this is Ulrich Talarek and Dima, our collaborators in Germany. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank the SACP for this wonderful award. Thank my colleagues who are going to speak next. Thank you. Yeah, George. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, okay, so I think if I understand your question is, why is it that you remove a tiny amount of ions and you get this large change in the electric field? Um, why is that? Well, you know, you know, if you have a resistor, I would say, you know, just an electronic resistor, and in that resistor you have a region of higher resistance, even if it's just a little bit higher, it'll be measurable and it'll have an effect on the output of the resistor. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I, I misunderstood the question. Yeah. Yeah. The chloride, you're constantly oxidizing chloride, and it's being swept away, but then there's more being generated. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, yeah, okay. Yes. No, no. They, all of our energy is going into chloride oxidation. Uh, well, yeah, sure. You can call it. That's it. Exactly. Yeah, Christian. Yeah. That's right, and carry the positive ions along with it for electroneutrality. So at this moment, uh, in the process, uh, after passing the, the, the yeah, uh huh. Uh, the solution wants to get the, the solution. Wants to get. Uh, so we have to pass the electron from the field. Yes, that's right, for electro electroneutrality. Yeah. I don't. I don't think so, Christian. I think the the reason for the twenty five percent. Let me see. I put. I, let me. Uh, uh, I've got all these slides here, but I'm not going to find the one I want, unfortunately. Um, you know, it. What what happens? You know, you can look at this this slide here. You know, what's happening, the problem is the bipolar electrode, there are two problems. One, the diffusion layer of that chloride oxidation is not reaching all the way to the top of the, of the microchannel. And so there's ions, you know, going over the local electric field. And in addition, we haven't made the bipolar electrode quite long enough. And so there's also creeping, you know, right here, there's also ions, move, you know, where the diffusion layer is not moving out far enough from the anode. So the simulations say 
that if we just put um, two bipolar electrodes, one on the top and one on the bottom of the microchannel, we should immediately get 50% desalination. So I don't think it has to do with the sodium. I think it has to do with the geometry. We haven't tested those simulations experimentally yet. All of the above. Yeah. Yeah, Peter? You know, yeah, that's a great question, Peter, and we've certainly talked about doing that. So, you know, maybe get 25% desalination each time. And, you know, we haven't done the experiments, nor have we done the simulations, and, and it seems intuitive that it should work. I'm a little concerned as you start reducing the chloride concentration in each step, it's going to make it harder to remove it in the next step. But we're going to do those experiments. Yeah. We need to do, we're going to, I don't know if we'll do the simulations or the, or the experiments first, but they're definitely on the, high up on the list. Thank you. Yeah. That's enough. Okay. Thanks, everybody.